that the site is uh, um, site has a top navigation essentially. Um, and the problem there is that since legacy has been around for 15 years, there's 15 years worth of business logic that has been baked into their older .NET platform that had to be exposed and um, you know those preferences had to be properly mapped and migrated. Um, and uh, Hussein will talk a little bit more about that migration in a little bit. And then the last component here is this, is this concept of infrastructure and the appropriate infrastructure and understanding what kind of trade-offs um, we make when we have certain caching strategies at different layers. Um, there was an uh, Akamai caching in front of the entire legacy website. Um, the Node React web applications was being hosted on AWS, but we also had this separate data center which was hosted in Chicago, which was the .NET platform that also needed to consume these APIs. And there was a very um, specific SLA which needed to be hit in order to ensure performance across the ecosystem uh, for these APIs. So. So, as I mentioned, uh, you know, so since we are dealing with two different teams, uh, so, you know, managing velocity around that so that, you know, there are no blockers for each other, right? So we chose a common methodology, uh, which was Scrum uh, for this project. And we were always once, you know, in terms of Drupal development, we were always one sprint ahead uh, of the, the front-end team um, and ensure that, you know, we were very proactive in sharing uh, the API designs up front and, uh, so, so basically to unblock um, the, the team to manage. Uh, also, uh, you know, it was very important uh, since we were, you know, Accelerant by nature is a very distributed organization. You know, we're basically spread out all over India and, you know, a lot, you know and, and rest of the world too. And, uh, you know, and there's another client who's also sort of distributed, right? So they had three different offices that we had to sort of work with. Uh, so it's really, really important for a project of this size and, and scope uh, that we, you know, keep the communication channels open uh, and we sort of over communicate <coughs> to see the success. Uh, so we used like tools like Slack, Zoom, um, Skype, email, phone, you know, even, you know, pull requests, right? So there were a lot of commenting that was happening on the pull request itself, um, you know, uh, to, to ensure that you know, we were never really blocking each other. You know, we got the information that we need and we kept moving on because it was such an aggressive timeline uh, to be hit, right? And they had it defined in a sort of a pretty hard deadline. Then um, some of the Drupal best practices that we followed during development, um, you know, uh, were sort of having consistent environments. So we knew up uh, pretty early on that, uh, you know, the solution would be hosted on Acquia Cloud. So we, uh, we said, okay, you know, what's the closest environment that we can get our hands on and uh, bring it into our development early so that there are no surprises, we could test it uh, and all of that, right? So we took uh, Jeff Geerling's Drupal VM, uh, brought that as part of our code base actually. So we pushed the environment as part of our code base. So anytime someone would check it out, they would have the environment within it. It's a vagrant uh, image if you don't know it. Um, and, uh, you know, and that's how we developed, right? That was our consistent <coughs> environment. Uh, that we followed throughout the life cycle of the project. Um, we also established a Git workflow, um, you know, within the team. Uh, we followed release branching um, and uh, feature branches here and, and, you know, ensured that we were maintaining release nodes uh, diligently. Uh, you know, it was very important because we were constantly delivering solutions uh, or delivering the, uh, the developed product over to the front end team. You know, we had to communicate that and release nodes became our sort of de facto uh, uh, document that everyone would sort of refer to. Uh, we also used uh, Drush build script, um, uh, you know, and established that early on in the project. Um, you know, so this helped us kind of maintain updates to core contrives, any patches that we are uh, putting in the system. It was all automated. Uh, so this would again save us time. Uh, you know, any new Drupal core release that came out, it actually did in the in the last four months of our. Uh, sort of working, there are a lot of contrips, so we could easily just run the Drush build script, get the new updates in, and and uh, we were done. Uh, again, feature-driven development, you know, it's it's not uh, new to anyone, but we ensured that we followed it to the best. Um, all configurations were checked in into the features, um, and uh, you know, it made a lot of our, uh, you know, brought a lot of consistency uh, in terms of uh, <coughs> output. Uh, we also had created a bunch of different checklists um, in the project, uh, both automated. We used a Drupal module called Site Audit, 
which sort of checks for Drupal best practices. And at the same time, we, um, we also created a bunch of our own checklists that we followed because you know, there were APIs that were being developed. There were you know, a bunch of different aspects of Drupal development that we looked at and created a pretty holistic checklist that we would follow on you know, after every release or before every release. <coughs> um, since we were deploying to multiple different environments, uh, uh, you know, it, it, there was a QA team from the like, side. There was our own internal QA team. There were a lot of features that were being developed. Uh, you know, we were constantly deploying to you know uh, our solution, right? We were constantly releasing it. So there's a Drupal module. If you guys haven't used it, there's a module called Environment. Um, you know, you could you could kind of you know fix, you know kind of plan your entire environments that you are deploying to uh, in that, and you and we basically scripted it all. So uh, we could simply uh, uh, you know kind of. Uh, just figure, you know, if it's a QA environment, we know what configuration the QA environment needs, which modules should be turned on and off, uh, all of that, right? So it was completely automated. Um, so highly recommend uh, if you guys haven't used environment, do go use it. Um, so just to give you some stats, we had used about 80 plus contrips in the project. Um, you know, I wouldn't go into too much detail around what was being developed, but uh, and 40 plus custom modules. Uh, the ecosystem. Uh, this sort of gives you a, a high-level sort of architectural overview. Uh, there's Akamai, there's the Node.js layer. Uh, we're hosted on Acquia, and it's the Drupal ecosystem um, uh, that's that's there. You know, using the you know REST APIs, we are delivering content back to the Node.js layer. Uh, so with that, um, you know, Lakshmi will kind of give you a deep dive <coughs> around this this component of the the platform. Uh, before that, any questions around what you've covered so far? Cool. So, uh, no headless implementation is uh, complete without a uh, RESTful API, right? So, uh, we chose a module called uh, RESTful for uh, doing that. Uh, the Drupal ecosystem already has got a uh, couple of other modules which are popular for doing this. You might have heard of services, and uh, there's one more called REST WS. Uh, when uh, we uh, evaluated RESTful, it was in its early stages, but the best part about RESTful was uh, uh, it was very developer friendly. Uh, the only prerequisite you needed is for the resource to be present in your uh, Drupal database. So you could uh, tweak it and uh, expose it as a REST resource. The other thing is uh, RESTful allows you to uh, uh, configure and fine tune every aspect of your API, like uh, caching, uh, headers, uh, the, the way you structure your uh, payload, uh, the authentication mechanism on a per endpoint basis. You can have uh, authentication scheme uh, OAuth for one endpoint, and you can have a token-based authentication for uh, another endpoint in the same system. So it was highly configurable. Uh, no API is uh, useful without having any documentation, because uh, we are used to consume that documentation, because only uh, computers can consume an API JSON uh, payload. right? So uh, there are a lot of competing standards for uh, specifying how exactly an API spec should look. Uh, you guys might have heard of uh, Swagger. There is RAML. Uh, we choose RAML because it closely resembles uh, YAML. It is readable both by computers and humans. Quite a lot of parsers exist in various languages for RAML. And uh, the best part about RAML is it allows you to uh, auto-generate test cases out of the specification. So the only thing we need to write, even before we start coding the API itself, was to write down an RAML spec and share it with all the API consumers and stakeholders so that they get a heads up of what exactly they will be expecting to consume when we publish the API. Uh, the other goodie about RML is uh, there is a PHP RML parser which allows you to pass an RML specification and uh, convert it into a Drupal web test case so that you need not spend your time writing manual test cases for an API endpoint. You have a lot of other better things to do, right? So if you guys can see this, uh, this is how an RML looks, pretty textual. You can uh, read it and infer or make make something out of it as to what the endpoint does. So this is an example of an RML format. It is, It very closely resembles its uh, cousin, the YAML format. 
uh, like I said, the authentication is pretty configurable, and RESTful comes with its uh, out of the box authentication, uh, which is uh, pretty secure. Uh, but we, not being a public facing API, needn't uh, have any such security requirements, which were very stringent. So we uh, just cut some uh, corners on that, and uh, we wrote our own uh, lightweight authentication to uh, get more uh, performance, to squeeze out more performance out of the whole system. Uh, because we used RESTful, we were able to do this. Uh, I'm not sure if we could have done this if we had used any other uh, uh, services-based module. Uh, there is a lot of uh, literature around uh, how you should version your uh, RESTful API. Uh, even the very fact that where you place it is a question of debate. Some people say that you have to place it in your uh, uh, URL, in your headers and all that. Uh, unfortunately, RESTful only allows you to place it in the URL. Uh, but there is an even a bigger question as to where you, how you increase a version number when you are creating a RESTful resource. Uh, we had this uh, 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 policy of uh, increasing the version, minor version number by one every time the payload changes or the behavior changes. Uh, the underlying concept here is your uh, RESTful uh, API version is a sort of contract between the consumer and the producer as to what the payload will be and what will be the authentication scheme and everything. So any of these changes, it's technically a change in contract, so you bump up the version number. So versioning was pretty useful in uh, describing a contract, the same way uh, RML was useful in describing a spec. Uh, we did have challenges with RESTful. Uh, we had an endpoint which had to imitate a URL alias in Drupal. So given a URL alias, you have to uh, get all the uh, uh, metadata and fields for that entity. It could be anything. It could be a user, or a node, or a taxonomy term. Uh, there were some tricky parts here as to uh, what do you do in case the alias is not found, or what if there is a URL redirect. You have to do a lookup on the URL table every time. And uh, fortunately, uh, there are a lot of modules which had exposed APIs for that. So we had to make use of those in RESTful. And uh, we need to expose the metadata of each and every entity along with that uh, URL alias. So we had to consume the uh, uh, endpoints provided by, uh, sorry, not the endpoints, the functions which uh, were exposed by MetaTags module to get the meta tags or metadata for that entity. Uh, RESTful ships with uh, uh, batteries included caching uh, functions and provision. Uh, you can uh, integrate it ready-made with uh, either Redis or Memcache. We had to do it with Memcache because our platform was uh, having Memcache only. Uh, there is a need to uh, clear your cache very uh, uh, diligently based on the context because uh, you have to uh, take a uh, diligent decision between uh, caching every time uh, resource changes versus caching only those endpoints which change when you change a particular node or a entity. So we had to perform this sort of mapping. So. I've detailed those in a few blog posts which I've linked here. Uh, we thought this is a very generalized use case, so I've, we have put it up as a contrib module in uh, D.O. You guys can check it out. I mean, not yet, because we've not put any code, so probably will. Uh, any questions around RESTful? Yes? Does RESTful support logging of requests Yeah, you can do it. You just have to. Whatever logging you are using, you just have to plug it inside your uh, resource handling uh, class or function. That's it. As you mentioned versioning, and uh, yes, you uh, plugged up uh, minor version. So is it like the older version will st still keep working? Yeah, the older version will still exist. Uh, that's a good question. I was expecting somebody will ask this, actually. So we uh, closely uh, follow the inheritance mechanism for version. Uh, anything which changes in uh, 1.3 from 1.2, we just inherit the previous class and then only uh, change the function which has... Uh, so let's say if there is a uh, Node.js API working right now on 1.2, one, 1 yeah. it will still keep It will still continue to work as long as you don't uh, decommission it or okay. disable it. So you can have multiple versions working at the same time? Simultaneously, point. yes, yes. Because there may be consumers who will be consuming the older API, as it happens in all... Uh, uh, REST API, so you don't want to disable that. Okay, thank you.
Хорошо. Hello. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, I'm Hussain. I'll be talking a bit about restful panels and uh, migration. Uh, so, one of the requirements of this uh, project was that even though it's a decouple system, the editor still wanted to maintain control over the layout, over the content in the layout, uh, and uh, so on. Uh, now, of course, you know, it's a decouple system. I mean, if it was not a decouple system, the answer is easy. You just use panels. You know, you, you get a very great interface, and uh, your whole suite of tools that <coughs> works with panels, and you're done. Uh, this is decoupled, right? So you you can't get, do that here. Uh, actually, before starting, we also looked at uh, presentation framework. How many of you here know presentation framework? Raise of hands. No one. So this is this uh, presentation framework I'm uh, talking about. It's a module. Uh, developed by Media Current, that's right, Media Current, right? Yeah, <coughs> uh, for weather.com. You know, weather.com runs Drupal now. And uh, <coughs> presentation framework is something they uh, use to make uh, handling panels easier. Uh, we started off this path, but uh, quickly realized that this is not really what we're looking for. We are just actually looking for the exact opposite, in, 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 something like you know, in a different direction. And, and uh, we, we built this. Yeah, so this is this was our problem. You know, we we, uh, we can let editors use panels. They have access to Drupal <coughs> backend, of course, and uh, uh, <coughs> your your standard panels configuration. You create panes and all that, but we wanted to. <coughs> I'm sorry, we wanted to make it available uh, via regular JSON output. You know, uh, in in a RESTful endpoint, and basically, the what you see on the screen that is what we wanted. Uh, your regular pane configuration converting into JSON, uh, something which you can work with in code. And we we built this. It, it's <laughs> contrib, I'll share a link. Uh, so this is like the overall working of restful panels uh, uh, from a very, very, you know, from Eagle's eye view. I'll not go too deep into this, but uh, if you're familiar with restful at all, you would know that uh, data provider classes are kind of common at restful. We use the same methodology. And uh, to actually render the panel, uh, the panel which the editor builds, uh, we are using the standard panels renderer. This is probably what you're using anyway on the front end. You know, you, you, there are out of the box, there are two choices, standard panels and IPE. Uh, we went with standard panels just because it's simpler. And uh, uh, in RESTful panels, you have a, something called structured render, which will kind of make it suitable for JSON output. And in our custom uh, namespace, you know, uh, very specific to legacy, uh, our requirements. We built a model called legacy pane, which would, uh, so in legacy, uh, these were not really panels, they were nodes, uh, whatever, whatever we wanted to return uh, through this endpoint. Uh, they were panelized nodes. Uh, so uh, restful panels also has a class called uh, restful panels panelize over there, which you can just extend and uh, uh, use it uh, just extend it in your custom module, and you'll be able to output panelizer as JSON. And uh, another another thing that this module provides is it passes in a RESTful context. Uh, do, you, do you know what I mean by context, as in panels and C tools context? Okay, some do. So yeah, basically what what this helps in is uh, like you saw in a screenshot uh, uh, before. Uh, so if this pane, uh, so this is the legacy pane you saw in that other diagram. Uh, you can, if, if it is being rendered normally, you know, on a normal page or something, it's being rendered as a bulleted list. But in JSON, it comes down into a structured uh, JSON object, you know, uh, your regular JavaScript object, key value pair, right? And this is made possible because a RESTful context is pa passed in, and the content type can take a decision. You know, should it render as array or should it render as a bulleted list? It's, it's, it's basically the flexibility is onto you. You know, you can do whatever you want with the data. So it is this this particular module is already contributed. It's available for use. There is a dev release. You can go try it out. I'd love to if you can. Uh, I'd love to hear from you if you try it out. Uh, it's d dot o slash project slash full underscore panels. <coughs> and. Uh, what this module currently lacks, you know, basically the reason it's in dev is because it's not completely tested with uh, a variety of context. 
right i mean we never had a use case in legacy and that's why it's not tested as of yet uh, that's one thing we want to uh, look into another thing is uh, meta tags uh, so um, you know meta tags module uh, i'm sure uh, so <coughs> you would uh, panelize the nodes they would have certain meta tags information along with it and uh, by default, of course, RESTful panels does not do anything. Right now, in uh, legacy pin, we are doing this, but I'm looking forward to add some support for that out of the box, because it's a very, very common scenario. And uh, panels variants, uh, again, uh, so a node, uh, you can have multiple variants, right? But they are actually really different displays. Uh, so you can, even now, you can use them, but uh, the, uh, the, uh, the onus of determining the display is onto you. Maybe that is something which the module can do as well. Uh, I'll quickly cover migration. It's, it's a very quick slide, and then I'll be open for uh, questions. Uh, so here we migrated from uh, SQL Server. And, and this particular uh, database was uh, built over 15 years. You know, so you can imagine you know, what kind of tables there might be. Uh, but one thing about that was uh, it, it was it, it's very different from um, your regular Drupal content module. You know, nodes, fields, um, field collections, and so on. Right, and so that was one of the challenge in correctly translating uh, the source data into uh, into Drupal specific data. It was just a different form of normalization, I would say, uh, and so what we what we basically did, you know, so. Uh, this is like a uh, best practice which you, which you should be following on your migration projects anyway, is that uh, you should map everything. I mean, if you uh, probably, if you don't know what I mean, then I think uh, it will not make sense now. Uh, but I'll go with it anyway. It's uh, you uh, migration uh, module, the framework allows you to map only the required fields. But uh, as a practice, we map each and everything anyway. So what, what happens in, like what happened here in this case was that uh, migration was iterative, uh, you know. So the development went hand in hand, and while the the site build was not finalized, we still we are we are already migrating data, right? Uh, so what if a field changes, you know, like the field name changes or fields have, fields get dropped or added all the time? Uh, migration framework would be able to tell us that if there is any any such change, it will give up an error. If you don't map any everything. You will get all the errors and you will just ignore them. But if you map everything, you will be on lookout for any such errors, which which is really helpful. Uh, we we also uh, migrated different types of data over different times, and so we just split them in migration groups. Uh, again, if you are familiar with migration, I, I really encourage you to look into this best practices. Uh, it's it's a great framework, great module. Um, so uh, in using uh, these mechanisms, we basically migrated around, uh, like you can see, uh, yeah, 2,500 articles, 5,000 media items, various galleries, around 1,100 affiliates. They're all very, very discreet. I mean, you can you probably see five bullet points on this, but actually they are very complex structures. And we probably had like 15 or 20 migrate. I don't really remember. But we had a bunch of different migrations covering each and everything. You can see right the data structures get really, I'm sorry, really complex. Uh, that's about it. Any any questions? How much time does it took only for migration? <coughs> uh, do you mean the development or the running of migration? Uh, so development, uh, I mean, it was spread out. Like I said, it went hand in hand with the de development of site itself. So each sprint, you know, we would identify that. Uh, uh, these are the these are the elements that have been built, and we would write the migration along with that. So my, uh, it was it, it went in hand in hand. So uh, I mean, if I say it, it was spread out over weeks, it doesn't give the correct picture because it did actually take weeks. It it, it was interspersed with other development. Uh, the entire run depends on the server. I mean, it takes. I mean, Jordan, do you remember how much, how long it takes to run a migration? It, Yeah, uh, it's it's it, it migration happened quite a while back. I don't really remember how much time it took, but yeah, I think that's fifteen to thirty minutes. One mentioned the rollbacks. Rollbacks took <coughs> yeah, okay. So that, that's uh, since you know, like there are uh, things uh, which field collections does, which makes it very very uh, heavy on performance to delete them. You know, creating them is easy in this case. Deleting takes time because. 
you know, our migrations were structured. That, like I said, the, these data structures were quite complex. Uh, so we had a migration just for field collections. Uh, so if you, if you try to roll back that migration, uh, each rollback for a field collection would uh, roll back a node. Uh, sorry, would resave the node. Uh, we actually submitted a patch to fix this. It is subsequently fixed, I think, you know, I mean, we, we, we found a lot of things, you know. So it's not just RESTful panels and RESTful purge that came out of this, you know, we, there were a variety of patches that uh, went in over the course of the development. Hussain, uh, what was the thought behind uh, using three collections? There are other alternatives available. Um, so it was this, use case. I mean, field collection was suitable for the job. I mean, do you have a more specific question? Because I really... Uh, I mean, just, we can make uh, field collections has issues with the uh, regions and all. Field collections themselves are entities, so uh, they would have their own revisions. Yeah, and I, and I see what you mean. Um, it just happened that it, it worked great for us. And um, I mean, like, do you want to add on to the answer, Anko, anything? Yeah, I mean, that's the only thing, and that was really fixed, actually. The structure was so complex, so you decided to use the data. Yeah. Uh, well, of course, the, the content structure is pretty complex, yeah, for certain kinds of uh, entities. I mean, some are just articles, yeah. simple, but you others are... want to create, like, entity references, they wanted everything on the same page. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. 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 I mean, field... Yeah. Gallery items were rich in terms of media. Um, there was a combination of quotes, videos, and images. If you go to legacy.com slash news slash galleries, you can check out how some of those look. Um, because of the uh, interoperability of different kinds of media, it was, you know, we, we needed to deliver all of those in the payload. So once in a while, you'd have a video, and then you'd have an image, and then you'd have a quote item. And depending on what was uploaded by the editor, in that specific field collection, that was what we were going to use. So it's very use case specific. Okay. All right, I'll pass it on to Basam. Ah, am I out of here? Yep. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so as you can see, the front end. Uh, at Legacy was quite diverse. We are using everything on top of the node layer. We use Express uh, to consume the APIs that Drupal provides. So uh, these APIs are then taken by uh, React and Flux implementations. Uh, so they take these APIs and render the client UI. So uh, we use other tools, open source tools like Babel for transpiling from ES6 uh, to ES5. We are using Webpack as our build system. And we are using stylus for uh, writing modular CSS. Uh, so, so yeah. So why did Legacy choose uh, uh, to write a application, client-side application using React? Well, there are these three main reasons: performance, developer productivity, and uh, to avoid content, content injections from uh, the affiliates and third parties. Uh, taking a performance first. Uh, with client-side applications, you get a slow initial page load time, but every subsequent uh, page transition or uh, every subsequent request is extremely fast compared to what you get with your conventionally developed applications. In turn, this uh, leads to an experience that's similar to what you get with native applications that are there on desktop and iOS or Android, app, Android phones. Another reason is developer productivity. So with uh, React, you get uh, composition easy composition, so uh, your uh, React application is built of small uh, components that form up huge applications like legacy. So with, uh, uh, with React, you can, uh, we were able to easily add new features, remove features without affecting the existing UI or uh, breaking any tests. So that made uh, a lot, uh, like, uh, that made us uh, agile and we were able to rapidly make the new changes. Similarly, event delegation and writing inline styles was uh, extremely easy. We use inline styles just to avoid cascading problems that are common in large code bases. This was pre-CSS modules era, so we rolled up our own solution for this. 
coming to testing, uh, your React components just consume a particular API and you get the component on your page. So what we did was uh, we took the component, uh, we passed it some JSON data and uh, rendered it on a headless or a real browser to test it out. So we used Phantom JS and we used uh, various versions of Chrome and Firefox for testing our uh, React components. Similarly, for testing out uh, uh, events or simulating events, we used a library that React provides called Test Utils. So it's as easy as calling a function. You just uh, call a function like click or key press, and that's it. Like you can replicate those features just by writing some code. So coming to uh, coming to some solutions that we implemented uh, while working on legacy, one of the most important one being server side rendering. So this helped us solve the SEO problem that is common with uh, uh, single page applications where usually the crawlers, the SEO crawlers get just a empty body tag and a bunch of scripts, so that's not useful. You aren't able to track any of your page content. So what we did is uh, we rendered the React components on the server using Node. Uh, so what happens is that uh, the first time the browser gets the page, it's the whole markup. And once it's there, once you have uh, the whole page there, uh, client-side rendering kicks in, and React uh, there takes over. So the, that helps uh, improving the initial page load time that is common with the single page applications. Another side effect, uh, uh, good side effect of this is that uh, since we are rendering uh, the client side application on the server, we were, e uh, we were serving just the plain uh, static HTML pages, so that made caching very easy. Uh, solutions specific to Drupal were like, we, as you already know, we are using Drupal as a data source, and as Hussain mentioned, uh, it's providing the layout configuration as well. So we consumed the layout configuration uh, to build out the page structures, and uh, these structures were later filled in with the data that was coming through Drupal. So you were getting a, a, a free, flexible uh, drag and drop UI to create your structures, and that were built using React. Some solutions specific to React were like, uh, React is, uh, doesn't like play well with uh, raw HTML. Uh, that's because the main feature of React, uh, virtual DOM, doesn't uh, doesn't come into play if you pass it raw HTML. So just to harness that functionality, we were what we did is we took the raw HTML on the Drupal layer, we stripped it out, took out the HTML tags and attributes, and then passed it to the client side as a JSON object. So on the uh, on the client side, we consumed this JSON object uh, and built the React components there. So we didn't have to have to compromise on the virtual DOM layer there. Uh, similarly, for complying to uh, specifications like schema.org, uh, what we did is we passed the meta, uh, metadata as JSON objects, and it was consumed on the client side using React. Okay. Any questions specific to front end? So, like, uh, in terms of infrastructure, it was an additional uh, pain to render first using Node.js and then pass on the HTML. Yes, yeah, like there are benefits to it, so yeah, you have to do it if you are implementing a client side application. But then, so uh, it was like you at last mentioned that you were uh, passing the metadata using JSON objects. Yeah. So that was for Node.js or for the final? That was for Node.js, and uh, for the subsequent request, uh, uh, React consumes that. So initially, Node takes it, and then once it's rendered on the uh, browser, uh, React takes it after that. Anyone else? Yeah. Uh, you mentioned we are using inline styles. Right. If I'm right, it means that you'll have a style attribute that you are actually stable. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, is it the inline styles discouraged? It will make uh, the CSS extremely difficult to manage. Uh, Right, uh, like uh, since React has come out, uh, like conventions have drastically changed. We are even writing the markup, the JavaScript, and the style sheets in the same file. So it depends on the developer productivity and uh, how well you can uh, manage your code base. So this worked out very well for us. Even face, uh, organizations like Netflix and Facebook have been doing this for a while now. So it scales very well for large code bases. So uh, basically, you're not doing the Drupal's theme. No, no, no. There is no theming done on the Drupal layer.
your stickers. All right. So um, some final thoughts as we wrap up the presentation, um, or I kind of want to say final learnings, uh, uh, having just gone through this very large decoupled, uh, decoupled project. Um, Continuous integration and continuous deployment best practices are really important when it comes to uh, making sure that a decoupled uh, project goes well. Um, if we had not accelerated our uh, continuous delivery, then uh, we would have left the front end team blocked whenever there was missing data or a new requirement or some kind of bug that they had uncovered. Um, we couldn't release on you know, our sprint cycles every two weeks, we needed to release when they needed the solution in order to unblock them. And so continuous uh, integration, continuous deployment um, is really important to have in place if you're gonna take on this kind of project. Um, personalization for decoupled Drupal, uh, uh, an arch decoupled Drupal architecture requires specialized infrastructure or middleware. Um, in looking at Things like the uh, affiliate universal navigation, the menus which are deployed across all of those affiliates. Um, the performance is, you know, uh, that, kind of, that kind of level of uncached requests is, uh, un uncached requests are, um, I guess, indicative of the need to host that kind of solution outside of Drupal. There's a lot of requests that were coming in for these menus that have a lot of context and a lot of personalization for these affiliates and there's more performance solutions in uh, Node and other architectures that we're considering at this point, looking forward. Um, another thing to keep in mind, if you're taking on a decoupled architecture and you're working across two different teams, um, you're planning for architecture across two separate systems. And the decisions that you make in order to perhaps deliver some kind of technological solution within Drupal greatly affects the kind of solution that needs to be delivered on the other side and vice versa. So if there is a gap that, um, that the front end has, Drupal is required to fill it. And if there is a gap that Drupal has, the front end has to, has to fill it. Um, an example of this would be, um, you know, we provide metadata for a lot of the discrete articles and galleries as they're rendered on the, um, on the URL resource from RESTful. Um, on other pages, such as uh, some of the RESTful panels pages, we actually serve up tokens which are contextualized based on the specific use cases of other parts of the ecosystem. Because we're using RESTful panels to kind of create this uh, configuration layout, we needed a solution where metadata was contextualized based on the front end instead of within Drupal. Um, when you're planning this kind of architecture uh, coupled system, you really need to take a lot of careful consideration with where you're introducing um, points of failure. Um, one of those is, is for example, uh, you know, this, your, this RESTful path resource. All of our redirects and um, 404 errors all come from this, from this resource. And so this needs to perform well at scale for the system in order to serve up all of those 404s and redirects and everything. Um, and again, you know, this is a final thought. This is a great, I think, case study for uh, an example of a progressively uh, decoupled system. Um, it's, it's something where we're continually innovating as we work on the project to uh, deliver new open source contributions for the Drupal community in order to continue to decouple certain parts of Drupal and deliver that. Questions? And not just for me, for anyone, the team members. How is caching validation handled? How is caching validation handled or invalidation? Yeah. Lakshmi, you want to talk about that? Uh, most of the times, there is no one-to-one -one mapping between uh, your data and your resource. So whenever uh, people make a change, it's more of a many-to-one. So we have to have a prior uh, uh, configuration as to when X or Y changes. Let's say bundle A, bundle B, or bundle C changes, then we 
invalidate the following endpoints. So we have this set up in code. Uh, RESTful allows you to do that, or rather has a provision to do that. So every time uh, there is a change in any of these, we have the probable hooks, right? So they take care of purging the respective endpoints, caches, and that's how we handle it. Uh, did I answer your question? What other uh, products? Um, I think one of those would be uh, Adobe Edge as an alternative. And I think that, that has some RESTful resource. Um, what's it, content, Contentful? What's the it's hosted? Contentful is a hosted uh, resource. It's really easy to build um, content architecture and expose those uh, pieces of data to. Um, to be consumed. Uh, Contentful is actually the use case where I was talking about earlier, or the, the business decision that Legacy made. They wanted to own the platform and own the data. When you choose a third-party service like that that's hosted, you don't actually own that system. If they go out of business, then you know, you're know you in a tight spot. <laughs> so that's one of the uh, key, key decisions, I think, that we made in going with Drupal. Any other questions? All right, thanks, you guys. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming. Welcome to DrupalCon Asia. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, we're presenting today a case study on legacy.com, uh, migrating a top 50 most visited website in the US onto Drupal. Um, uh, first, I'd like to introduce the team. Uh, my name is Jordan Ryan. I am a CTO of Fast Interactive, and I was the solutions architect and product owner during the delivery of Legacy.com's migration to Drupal. Um, and Anker, CEO of uh, Accelerant, introducing yeah. the team. So uh, Accelerant was brought in to do the implementation work for the project, and Jordan and I, we worked together, uh, including some of the team, team members are here. Um, that's me that uh, led the API development to say that uh, a lot of the migration work also uh, uh, you know, an important component of the, uh, the project was uh, managing presentation uh, and uh, there's a module contract that has come out. And Basam was part of the front-end team implementing Node.js React solution. So before we get started, I'd like to just introduce Legacy a little bit. Um, <coughs> Legacy is, as I mentioned before, a Concast Top 50 website. Um, they have roughly a uh, few hundred million page views a month. They've got um, maybe uh, 20 to 50 million uniques on any given month. Um, and they uh, serve most of their content traffic through uh, affiliate partners. They serve obituaries across um, roughly a few thousand uh, newspapers in the continental US and also internationally. And uh, they consume obituaries from these newspaper partners and serve them up on their uh, channel pages for those newspapers. Um, Legacy's uh, uh, business, as far as the, uh, the Drupal solution that we're presenting today, uh, is just focusing on the features or the news editorial section of their site, which just drives a lot of their uh, consumer engagement once they have users that come into the site from these affiliate channel partners. Um, so one of the questions you know, everyone always wants to have answered is why Drupal. Um, we'll talk a little bit before, uh, a little bit more about why Legacy specifically wanted to. Uh, let's see here. Sorry, guys. How's that? Better? Sorry. Um, <clears throat> We'll talk a little bit more about why Legacy wanted a uh, decoupled architecture in just a little bit. But first, um, we have to talk about why they wanted to use Drupal. And the answer to that is very simply that uh, they were building a team that was going to create an innovative and um, uh, progressive front end in terms of design. And they wanted to be able to uh, quickly iterate on the design and implement new features. And so in order to do that, in order to deliver 
um, that kind of solution. They wanted to have Drupal as a service. Um, they, wanted, they wanted a service architecture so that they could continue to uh, deliver um, a high, uh, high quality uh, consumer experience, but they didn't want to spend a lot of time innovating within the CMS space. And so they looked to Drupal for that kind of expertise and uh, delivery. Um, so, as I mentioned before, why decoupled? Uh, Legacy was really looking to innovate on the front end. They didn't want to uh, innovate um, in the CMS. They were looking to a tried and true implementation. Um, and Drupal was kind of the, the enterprise standard for them based on their requirements that we went over in their discovery phase. Um, content was a small part of a much larger ecosystem. When you look at when you look at legacy's um, when you look at legacy's architecture, um, the content system only serving a few million page views a month compared to their much larger few hundred million page views a month means that uh, the Drupal application itself did not need to be scaled up in the same way that their node react application needed to be um, you, and using React and Node, was, which was the decision by Legacy for their front-end application, um, that lent itself to componentized uh, widgets that needed services in order to be uh, populated with data. Um, again, another reason why we chose Decoupled. Uh, Legacy wanted to own the data and platform. This kind of goes back to uh, why Drupal as opposed to why, uh, why not use an additional hosted service. There's certainly some um, other solutions out there that can provide RESTful APIs for content. Um, but Legacy's goal of, ha of owning that content and owning that platform was another key decision on why they decided to go with a, a decoupled Drupal implementation. <coughs> so in talking a little bit about what we did, um, this, is, this is just a quick uh, overview, and then we're going to go through each of these pieces in detail. Um, the initial, the, uh, uh, in context, all of this happened over a very fast-paced six-month timeline. Um, the initial discovery engagement was about four weeks to six weeks. And then after that, uh, I was working with Legacy in order to bring in additional partners in order to uh, deliver this solution. Um, after executing the discovery and deciding on some of the architectural components, uh, we brought in uh, Accelerant. Yes, yeah, so on the Accelerant side, we covered uh the technical architecture for the for the solution, uh, we did like a lot of the site building, um, you know, and any custom development, um, and then uh, the core of it, which was the API development, um, we migrated data from uh, MS SQL, um, and uh, you know, continued to help their front end team. A lot of pro performance op optimization work was done, and we continue to engage with them and uh, in. You know, there's a continuous discovery that's happening on the solution, and we've been working since. So some of the key challenges uh, that we are trying to address, um, you know, using, uh, you know, the Drupal solution that we are proposing. Um, so there were actually two teams. So Legacy already had their front end team, which was impl going to implement a Node React solution, and uh, you know, so they ha had a different velocity than than we did. So it was a challenge that we had to sort of uh, take care of when we were implementing, uh, you know, the, the Drupal solution. Um, then uh, managing presentation. So there was a, a unique requirement. Uh, they wanted to give editors control over the layout of a page. So as you know, if you, if you're working with a, a decoupled system, controlling layout, uh, you know, in Drupal, uh, how do you do it, right? So th there's been a couple of different uh, approaches to that. Uh, we came up with a, a, a unique uh, solution, uh, which Hussein will talk about it, uh, you know, during his presentation. Also, uh, power of Drupal is uh, really to manage metadata. Uh, the SEO value is the key, right? So you have content, you have metadata around it, and that's what enriches, uh, you know, it's great for search engines. How do you bring that value onto a decoup decoupled platform? Um, so that was another challenge that we had to uh, consider when we were uh, building the solution out. Um, you know, since uh, there were a lot of APIs were being developed, uh, we had to ensure that you know we were uh, constantly versioning APIs so that 
you know, we weren't causing issues for the front-end team. Uh, you know, any contracts that we laid up front uh, were, were adhered to, and any new changes that we would make uh, were versioned in the APIs. Um, and also, uh, legacy in by you know in by nature as a business, they work with a lot of different newspapers, and uh, you know, so they had to serve out a lot of menu content uh, to these newspapers. So it was highly customizable, uh, but it had to be extremely cacheable, uh, so that you know the performance, like the you know the kind of uh, volume, uh, traffic volume the site gets, right? Um, so that we could continue to serve it. So there were a lot of varying page elements uh, that needed to be addressed. And likewise, there was a caching uh, mechanisms that had it to be put in, right? So we considered all of these uh, problems um, in, our, in our solutions. Um, also on the React end, React isn't like HTML, as most of you know. Um, so we had to sort of look at componentizing HTML for the various React elements. Now we'll talk about you know sort of some of our methods, how we went at, and uh, did some of this. So, sure. The discovery so um, uh, going back to that initial discovery, um, some of the things that we executed in order to deliver the most value to the client is this concept of value-driven development. Um, the concept of value-driven development is the idea that we define <laughs> the business metrics or key goals for each of the epics or user stories and document those in, in the tickets so that when a developer implements a solution, they have some context with which they can actually deliver that solution that's going to have the most value for the client as opposed to um, you know, a less defined uh, user story which may not capture those specific business values. Um, another element that we focused on early on in the discovery process is API designs first. Um, focusing on what that contract was going to look like based on the uh, initial comps that were delivered by the client um, and they had executed. Um, and that allowed us to take a look at things like uh, the, the content architecture, you know, how that content ar architecture is going to be built out within Drupal in order to expose those fields. Um, another another key, uh, uh, key item is, is Legacy was really looking to Drupal to become a platform solution. And when I say that, I mean the delivery needed to be such that um, um, the interface was dependable. Um, there's a lot of uh, additional complex business logic that we also had to extract over the course of the discovery. This actually uh, is what spurred the continuous discovery that needed to take place over the course of the project because um, as we uh, worked with the client and worked with the front end developers, uh, requirements changed. I'm sure you all have been through that before. Um, and most particularly where requirements continue to change and be revised is around the uh, affiliate partners or the solution which was explicitly being developed for those affiliate partners which was a universal navigation. It was a, it was a menu that was being delivered across everywhere.